Hi, everybody. This is uh, Gad Saad for The Sad Truth. Today, I have a rarity on the show, a novelist and a nonfiction author, Douglas Brunt. How are you doing, sir? Great to be with you, Gad. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so delighted to have you with me. Let me just read a very, very quick bio of you, and you could add anything that you think I might have missed. You're a New York Times bestselling author and host of the Dedicated with Doug Brunt podcast, uh, which I am honored to be appearing on in about a month or two. I uh, know two months, I think, in, in early December. You have three previous novels, Ghosts of Manhattan in 2012, The Means in 2014, Trophy Son in 2017, and your current book, which came out uh, in September, The Mysterious Case of Rudolf Diesel. It's it's really a historical book, so it's not a it's not a fiction book. Uh maybe we'll start with this one and then we'll talk about your uh how you actually create all these characters in your novels. Uh tell us about Diesel. I must admit, just like your wife, people who don't know it's Megan Kelly. I listened to your chat. All I knew about Diesel is that that's the thing that I shouldn't put in my car. <laughs> and it ended there. So please teach us. That's right. So eight years ago, I, I was the same as, as you and most of your listeners probably misspelling diesel with a lowercase d, <laughs> thinking it was maybe a fuel that we're supposed to avoid for our cars. And uh, but you see it every day. It's on it's at the fueling station. It's on a truck on a train. I bought a boat. And I was I was it was an older boat and, and slightly larger. And the guy at the boat yard was saying, well, the first thing you should do to fix this boat up is get rid of these gasoline engines and put in diesels. And so I was saying, well, why? I didn't realize it was a, a different kind of engine. So he launched into this thing saying that 100% of boat fires come from gasoline engines, zero from diesel. The fuel is completely stable. There are no fumes. You can drop a lit match into a barrel of diesel fuel and nothing happens. Plus, you get three or four times the fuel efficiency. So on your 200-gallon tank of fuel, you'll go three or four times as far. So I repowered with diesels. And then about a year later, as you say, I've pre previously written a few novels. And I was searching around for ideas that might get me going on a novel. And I was just clicking around the internet and I came across this list of mysterious disappearances at sea. And on the list was Rudolf Diesel. I didn't know there was a man behind the diesel lens. I just thought it was just some sort of, you know, not proper noun. So I click on this and it tells this crazy story, true story of Rudolf Diesel. Back in 1913, on the eve of World War I, he's traveling from Belgium to Great Britain on an overnight passenger ferry. And as he's crossing the North Sea in the night, he disappears. And so he's supposed to meet his two traveling companions for breakfast. He doesn't show up. They hold the ship at sea. They do a search. All they find are his hat and his coat folded at the stern of the ship by the rail, seeming to mark where he's jumped overboard. And so the presumption is suicide. But two other theories hit the newspapers because it's really hard to, to imagine today, as we all don't even know there is a person, Rudolf Diesel, but at the time he was a huge global celebrity. It would be like Elon Musk disappearing today, just suddenly, you know, hopped a flight to Nantucket and then at was gone. At that level, at, at Elon Musk level? Truly at that level. He was a global celebrity. The, it was the front page of the New York Times, front page of the papers in London, all through Western Europe, even out to Russia. Headlines of every newspaper that the great inventor has disappeared. And two theories of murder appeared. One was that John Rockefeller may have murdered him or, you know, agents of big oil. And the other was that Kaiser Wilhelm II, the emperor of Germany, may have murdered him and sent his agents because he, and, and we can get into this, but he represented an existential threat to both of those figures because his engine had by 1913 emerged as a, a dominant power source for both industry and war. So, so in the, in the case of, uh, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II, it's it's a military threat. In the case of Rockefeller, it's a pecuniary threat. You, you're going to affect the bottom line of my wallet. So we've got suicide, we've got murder. Uh, I don't want you to give away any sort of giveaways. I want people to read the book. Mm -hmm. But if you were to assign a points on 100 as to which of suicide versus murder, it's Kaiser, murder, it's... Uh, uh, Rockefeller, where does the evidence stack up from what we know until you came along? Well, if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, it's suicide. And suicide has been the presumption for the last century. And the crazy thing is that there are so many holes in that theory. And the, the one thing I do give away is that it wasn't suicide. Um, as you go through the evidence, 
that's available now, it's so much easier to go back and do this sort of what is really an, uh, a circumstantial case. But you can look at the newspaper reporting from the time. So much, you know, there, you can do what I would call library research now with subscriptions to different databases. More is scanned every day. I can look at every newspaper from every city around the world now from that era. It would have been very hard to do that in 1930 and reconstruct this case. You'd have to actually go to the cities and pull newspapers out of cabinets and things like that. So it's easier to do some of that research now. But it, it very clearly was not a, a suicide. Uh, but I, I reconstruct that sort of quarter century leading up to World War I. And it's a fascinating cast of characters, not only in the diesel story of where the engine went around the world and who was using it, but also how he became such a threat to Kaiser Wilhelm and to Rockefeller, because the diesel engine represented something totally new. And the, has any, I mean, I guess it's a, officially it, it's an open case. I mean, is there, a, or it's a cold case, I guess, a really, really super cold case. I mean, yeah. in terms of police. Yes, yeah. So I, I put together a, a theory of the case, a sort of a conclusion based on circumstantial evidence, ran it by NYPD, former CIA, former FBI, and most tellingly, former British Intel, and all came back saying, wow, a thousand percent your conclusion, which I am not yet revealing here, uh, is is correct. Wow. That, that this has to be what happened. So ha are there any descendants of Diesel that are alive and with whom you might have spoken about the case? I found two. Uh, one is Jean-Philippe Diesel. He lives in France, sort of in the corner, like right on a German border there. And another was, a, and he was sort of, he was descended from Diesel's uncle. So, it was, but it, you know, last name Diesel and has followed the family history. And then uh, a woman who was descended from Rudolf Diesel's daughter, Hetty. And both are, you know, interested, of course, in the family history. Both had just sort of assumed what was in the encyclopedia was correct. So they were like, you know, thinking this is an incredible book uh, and were thrilled to read it. All their lives they'd been thinking, you know, suicide was the, the, what, the conclusion. Wow. So what is the process? I mean, we'll, we'll get into the creative process for your novels, but even in, in the mm -hmm. case of this book, as you said, there, there's a lot of archival work that has to go into weaving this incredibly intricate story. Walk us through the process of how one goes about doing that. For the, for the nonfiction book, this was totally new to me. Usually when you sell fiction, you write the full manuscript, you write almost the whole novel. And then you sell it. And actually, these days, you really do have to finish it up and maybe even work with a freelance editor, but get it in a pretty good shape before you try to sell it. And, you know, 20 years ago, and the publishing houses were a little bigger and more well staffed, they might acquire a novel that was, say, 80% done, and they would work with you and get it to 100%. Now they've really skinnied down their editorial staffs. And when they acquire books, it's more like 98% of the way there, and they might, you know, finish it up with you. Um, and many of those editors that were formerly in the big houses are now independent freelance editors that work with, you know, young and up and coming writers. But basically you write the book and you sell the book. What I learned in this process is that's not how nonfiction works. In nonfiction, you sell a proposal and you're familiar with this. There's maybe a sample chapter. There's a detailed outline of what you're going to do. There's a list of the research that you have done and will continue to do. And the new information you'll present, a list of competitive works and market, things like that. It's a standard proposal format is roughly 30 pages or so. So I didn't know that. I, I worked with a new agent who helped me go through the proposal structure, built out this proposal. And I'd been working on the book for quite a while already because in the beginning, I'd considered writing it as historical fiction. And the more I did research, the more I developed a theory of the case and the more I found things that were supporting that theory. And I realized there was almost nothing written about Rudolf Diesel in the English language. There are two academic biographies, one from the 60s and one from the 80s, very little about him. So I realized I've got to tell this story for real. I've, I've got to do the nonfiction version of accounting and do it and truly try to do justice to his legacy. So I went through a very different process on the nonfiction side. Um, with fiction in the past, I've always done a lot of research for these books anyway, less archival. My, my three previous novels were all set roughly present day. So a lot of the research I did there was primary research, interviewing folks. Um, I, my most recent novel, which came out called Trophy Son, was about a tennis prodigy. And it was really focused on um, our, our culture's new 
obsession with single sport specialization for early youth. If you're seven years old and you're a good tennis player, that's what you do to the exclusion of almost everything else. And tennis is very intense in that way. You, you get pulled out of mainstream schooling and go down to some tennis academy if you're you're really promising. So for that, I interviewed James Blake and John Isner and other great tennis players, many who went to the Boletari Academies but never cracked the top 500 as well, but now still exist in the orbit of tennis as a tennis coach or you know running the rackets program at a club and things like that. So I love the research piece of it. That's always been a part of what I've done for my novels. I think it helps get the story down with a little bit more force on the page. If you have that knowledge, even it almost becomes instinctual. Just knowing you know it helps you write it better. So I've enjoyed the research piece, but as you say, this is much more archival. This is all hundred plus years ago. It, it, do you have a preference in terms of the creative process? Do you, do you, you, I mean, you've only done one that is nonfiction, but having now done both genres, it, uh, you know, are you are you better suited for one or the other, or both are exciting because they're so different? Both exciting, but I prefer the nonfiction side. It was. It was so fun to have these moments where I'd be in archives and I would discover something that to anyone else would be not that big a deal. But in the context of the story that I'm creating, it draws a connection that is enormous. You know, Churchill is a huge figure in this book. Adolphus Bush, the founder of Anheuser-Busch, is a huge figure in this book. He, he was the, Amer the American diesel pioneer. And you, you'd find something, you know, Churchill said this two days after Rudolf Diesel said that, and it was, it was meaningful. And it was like the, the nerd side of Indiana Jones, where you discover a little piece of treasure uh, that, that is something you can share with the world in the, in this book that is, is, is meaningful history. What explains the fact, I mean, in, in reading some of the, the blurbs for, for the book, I haven't yet had the chance to read the entire book, but in, in going uh, through those blurbs, uh, you know, I I can't remember if it was you who mentioned it or it was part of the the the, the synopsis from you know the media kit that that you know he he should be standing along many of the illustrious other thinkers of that era and yet he's somehow mm -hmm. forgotten and that right away reminded me of so I'm as as you probably know I'm an evolutionary psychologist and so of course Charles Darwin holds a very special place in my heart yet Alfred Wallace who independently came up with the theory of evolution is mm -hmm. a little asterisk footnote. And, and there are historical reasons for why that might be the case. So in your case, what explains why Diesel is so unknown to most people and that only two academic biographies exist of his life? Yeah, the, the, that, the story of why his history has been paved over this last century is somewhat explained by the element of the caper in the book. And so I'll go back to 1913. The reason Kaiser Wilhelm found him to be such a threat is that by 1913, the diesel engine had emerged as the only engine that could power a submarine or U-boat. And gasoline and kerosene engines wouldn't work. They, they were spark ignition. They were flammable. They were constant boat fires. You didn't have the range to get a submarine out into open waters and control sea lanes. But with the diesel engine, all that changed. And suddenly the, the submarine became a terrifying offensive weapon. And this was at the peak of the Anglo-German naval arms race. And so suddenly every naval, uh, every Navy of the, of the major powers is scrambling for diesel expertise and Rudolf diesel, because the engine is still fairly young. He only introduced it in 1897. He's still the main guy that can help you use the diesel engine for these exacting requirements of undersea travel. So they're all, they all need diesel. And the reason he was crossing the North sea in September of 1913 is he was going to great Britain to be the board director and co-founder of a diesel engine manufacturing company, a brand new one whose mandate it was to build diesels for the Royal Navy submarine fleet at the height of these tensions and on the brink of war. So that, that, would, that would be seen as treasonous by Kaiser Wilhelm. The reason Walk Rockefeller found him to be such a threat is diesel had been advocating that the diesel engine run on fuels other than petroleum. He had won, <clears throat> 13 years before, he had won the World's Fair in Paris in 1900 on a, with a diesel engine running peanut oil. And in 1912, he had traveled through America saying, I can break the American fuel monopoly and I don't need a law to do it. I don't need the Sherman Antitrust Act. I can do it with the power of my technology because it, it was very flexible with regard to fuels or vegetable oil, peanut oil, coal tar. And he was saying, if we have farmers, we can grow our own fuel. We don't need to be beholden to the oil trusts or areas of the world where there's petroleum in the ground. And that's still true today. Willie Nelson was on a tour 15 years ago, traveling around his, his tour bus 
on a, a diesel engine running recycled kitchen grease. So the diesel engine remains very flexible with regard to fuels. And it's crazy the deficit of appreciation for, for diesel in these days, as you say, like, why is he not up there with the Wright brothers and Marconi and Edison and Bell? It's because <clears throat> it's partly explained because the presumption of suicide. And then the other is the, the element of the caper that comes in this book. And, and when you get to the conclusion of what happened to diesel, you'll sort of understand this piece. But one quick thing I can, there's like sort of a bit I do at this point, you know, on book tour, you can pull the string on my back and I blah, 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 and I tell the <laughs> thing. But imagine a piece of fruit grown in a tropical region. Every piece of heavy machinery and farm equipment used to grow that fruit is diesel powered. The fruit then gets loaded onto a truck. Anything on the roads larger than a passenger car is diesel powered. It then goes down to port where a crane, diesel powered, loads it onto a cargo ship. 100% of cargo ships on the oceans are diesel. Really, like the only boats on the, on the water are these sort of outboard pleasure boats. Anything bigger than that is diesel. So it goes across the oceans under diesel power, goes into a port, gets loaded onto a truck, onto a train. From about 1960, 1950, 1960, every train in the world, diesel powered, gets low, you know, taken into a warehouse somewhere inland where very likely a power plant is diesel powered. Really, nothing moves in our global economy without diesel. And that's to this day. And the fundamental design of the engine, which is this high pressure engine, uh, is, is basically the same as what diesel introduced more than 120 years ago. Wow. What it from a, on the Greta Thunberg metric of green. And so for her <laughs> not to be upset with us, does he score? better on on green and, and forgive my ignorance i mean short of knowing that these different you know uh, en energy producing uh, mm -hmm. machines i know very little about this how does it stand in terms of the green continuum well i'll answer that in two time periods so in 1913 it was extraordinary and and pollution and efficiency were his two of his main objectives and efficiency was his number one objective pollution was his number two objective and then there were these subsidiary benefits that you know like the cold start it didn't you didn't need to raise steam so a military craft you could just turn diesel on and off you go as opposed to the steamships of the day where you had to spend hours boiling water by you know burning coal and quote unquote raising steam so a military ship's like all right let's go and then it's three hours later they're still boiling water to get the ship going whereas diesel you just off you go so it had hu huge military advantages but Efficiency and pollution were two of his main goals. And, it, and you can see it in the difference of the ships of the day. Like it, one of the visuals I paint in the, in the book is the, the movie Titanic, that famous Leonardo DiCaprio movie. And they, the camera goes down into the belly of the ship and you see these dozens and dozens of sweaty guys shoveling coal into a furnace, this orange hiery hot, hot, hot furnace, which is basically boiling a vat of water. I mean, it's simple technology, like a pot on a stove. They're just boiling water. Wow. And then that creates steam to move the gears. That's the steam engine. But it also had a whole chimney furnace apparatus where the chimneys go up through the middle of the ship and blow those pillars of black smoke, partially burnt particles of coal into the atmosphere. The diesel didn't need any chimney apparatus at all. It just vented a minimal amount of exhaust out of vents out of the side of the ship. So for cargo, now you don't have these giant you know, chimneys in the middle of your ship. You have just a clear deck of, cargo, of space for cargo. For a battleship, suddenly you're your guns, rather than being obstructed by giant chimneys on the deck, can pivot to a 300, to any point on the horizon, a 360 degree. So for a military, again, it had advantages of really essentially doubling the power of your guns on the deck because they could, the guns could point anywhere as opposed to only half of the, half of the horizon. So in, in his day of 1913, pollution-wise, it was a massive game changer. It was much cleaner than the steam engines. Today, diesel has taken some hits um, but it, like there was a Volkswagen scandal, but they've they've put in more filters that that make it much more competitive in terms of exhaust and getting rid of the the nitrous oxides and things which were the problem with diesel before. So now it's actually very clean, and it's still far more efficient than a gasoline engine. In fact, I think Cadillac has just announced that next year all their SUVs are going to be diesel, and one of the things they're touting is it's the fuel efficiency is extraordinary over gasoline, so you get far more miles to the gallon. So why is it that the diesel engine is not as widespread as it, as it should be in regular cars, right? So 
and before you answer that, just again, for the complete lay people who are watching, of which I include myself, I know I'm, I'm probably the least mechanically inclined person in the world, which somehow seems emasculating. I should know how to do things, but I <laughs> no, don't. I, can, I can't even hang a curtain rod. So you're in, you're in good company here. And, and you managed to attract a pretty desirable woman. And so have <laughs> I. So you see, guys, you could not be a mechanic and still be attractive to the ladies. But OK, so the diff. So there is an engineering element which makes the diesel engine more efficient, as you said. But the raw mm -hmm. material that goes either into the diesel engine or the regular fuel injected engine of a car is that different? What What's the main difference? And why don't we have more of the diesel engines in regular cars if it's so efficient? The, the difference is the, the sophistication of the engine and the weight of the engine. So in the early days, uh -huh. the, the early combustion engines that run gasoline and kerosene, again, flammable fuel, there's a spark ignition. Those were like half a horsepower, one or two horsepower. They're very weak engines. And Benz would use them for his early motor cars that looked like sort of a big tricycle almost, those early cars. Diesel sort of combined the best of the internal combustion auto cycle engines and the big steam engines. It had high torque, high horsepower. The early, even the early diesel engines could get into hundreds of ho horsepower. So they could do heavy load work um, with lots of torque, you know, for accelerating a truck with a heavy load and that sort of thing. But it was a harder and more expensive engine to build. It, it required superior metal casting, which in the, the early 1800s didn't even exist. I mean, in the James Watt days of the 1770s, those steam engines, in order to get seals on their pipes, they were using rope and leather and things. You can imagine how much pressure is lost with that. The way the diesel engine works is that it's a high pressure engine. So imagine a bicycle tire pump. And when you take the plunger and you jam it down to force the air out into your tire, uh, you know, over and over again, it, it builds heat. If you ever have pumped a few tires in a row, your bicycle tire pump feels a little bit hot. That's the idea of the diesel engine, only it's completely enclosed, doesn't let air leak into the into the tire pump. It's just a, an enclosed cylinder. And when you jam that plunger down, that highly compressed air creates heat. And at a thousand pounds per square inch, it's extremely hot. Then they inject the fuel and then the fuel explodes. So there's no spark, there's no fire until it's under extremely high pressure. But maintaining that pressure takes superior metal casting beyond what they use in a gasoline or, or kerosene type of engine. And so it's, it's better metal, more superior casting, but it also results in a heavier engine, which is why it was best suited for trains and ships and, or, or inland stationary use where the weight was okay. You know, you couldn't put it on some tiny little passenger car that, that really wouldn't support the weight. Well, that what, what an amazing answer you gave, because now that explains to me why you see it on trucks, but not on, because I've always wondered, but never thought much of it. Why is it that trucks use diesel, but not cars? It's really a function of the, it, it works well with heavy machinery because you can dilute its weight amongst the larger mm -hmm. weight, hence trains, right. hence ships, hence trucks. And even for passenger your pleasure boat crafts. Recently, I think it was Johnson & Johnson or Mercury, one of these outboard engine manufacturers for boats, for passenger boats, was like, oh, we're going to come up with an outboard diesel. And they even announced it, but then it turned out it was too heavy, it just didn't work as an outboard engine. Just, you know, that amount of weight on the back of the boat didn't work. It's, it's, so it's still, it's a heavier engine. So it, it's best in certain environments and, and not others. And why would you, so if, if it can use the kitchen grease and the vegetable oil or peanut oil, is the main reason why we don't do that because you can't produce that source in an industrial scale level that would be needed to power an economy? I mean, is that the key obstacle? That's the obstacle. And that's what Rockefeller and the petroleum folks made sure there was never a business case to build out that infrastructure. And there's one story from Rockefeller's past that I can share to demonstrate that. So that one of the interesting things about Rockefeller and Standard Oil generally is it was founded in 1870. By 1900, Rockefeller was the richest man in the world. In those 30 years, they didn't sell gasoline. Gasoline was a waste product that they would toss away. They were selling kerosene and Rockefeller was in the illumination business. He was, he was a lighting guy. But then along comes the light bulb, the electric light bulb from Edison and others, which threatens to do to Rockefeller what Rockefeller had done to the whaling industry. You know, basically, I'm going to wipe out your market because the, the electric light bulb really is just sort of superior technology. But back in the, in the lighting days of, of Rockefeller, he wanted to get into the Chinese market. 
And in China, for centuries and centuries, they'd been using natural gas and, and oils for illumination. Rockefeller comes in with Standard Oil, and they, they give away these beautiful, gorgeous little kerosene lamps that are well-designed, give great light, and they're free. And he gets them all over the place and sells kerosene nice and cheaply. Now everybody's saying, well, this is wonderful. I've got this free kerosene lamp. And then the price of kerosene goes up. So he got his market addicted to his product. So it was a sort of a, a situation where supply controlled demand. And he did the same with the gasoline combustion engine market. He, he made sure gasoline was readily available and, and inexpensive and tried to supply it into where areas where the internal combustion engine was, was developing, like the automobile, because it really was not a, a, a sure thing that petroleum and gasoline was going to be the fuel of the 20th century. And in fact, another in, in this book, there are a, about 100 little footnotes in there. And this is something my editor and I wrestled over that because I used to have about 300. And he's like, it's too much. And I get it. It's annoying. You're sort of reading along, and then you got to go down and read the foot and come back up. And so I wanted to get just enough to make it like a, a little present to go down to the bottom of the page, something you'd sort of look forward to. And in one of those is a fact that in 1905, New York City had a fleet of taxi cabs, hundreds of taxi cabs, all electric. And there was a charging station on Broadway in Times Square in 1905. So we wow. think about these electric cars as this newfangled thing that Elon Musk is doing. No, it was going on 120 years ago. And Edison and Ford were actually working together on an electric car. They couldn't couldn't sort of get the battery technology right. And of course, Rockefeller is also there saying, hey, but this gasoline is right here and it's inexpensive. You can just do the combustion engine. And as soon as they got the electric starter going, you know, because you used to have to sort of crank out the starter on these on these gasoline cars, which nobody wanted to do. And they solved that problem. The gasoline car took off. The electric car just sort of went by the wayside. Um, wow. But it's 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 there are so many fascinating little nuggets of what was going on in the world at this time. And and as we get into the nuances of engine technology, which we still is so little understood, even 120 years later, but when you get into it, it it makes so much more of the century make sense. Did you connect? I mean, earlier I asked you if you connected with any of the descendants of uh, uh, Diesel. Did you connect with any of the descendants of Rockefeller, since he is a an important uh, character in the story? I I did not. I did not. I, his role to me was well understood, and there's enough material on that. I did not connect with Rockefeller descendants, but it'd be interesting to to do that and get their perspective on this. The the way the book is set up, it's very it. it it does a lot of things, and I hope does them well. In part, it's a biography of Diesel. It's mini biographies of Rockefeller and Kaiser Wilhelm II, who are fascinating characters. I mean, Kaiser Wilhelm II in particular is such a, you know, I, I have a slightly more sympathetic view of him just because he was almost like a tortured child. But it's biographies of them. It's, a, it's sort of an Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes whodunit in terms of what happened to Diesel. And, and the book does crack the case. But it's also, as we've as we've sort of learned here, like a combustion engines for dummies a little bit, <laughs> as well as a, a mini primer on 19th century diplomacy, which I have to say, I love the lead up to World War One as a as something to study. I mean, it's a, a terrible, catastrophic war. But it's also after the war, it's almost as though people looked around like, why in the heck did we do that? And it's much more nuanced than World War Two in the sense that that had such a good and evil uh, element to it, whereas World War One you know, the French weren't exactly helpful in, in stopping things. And it wasn't all Kaiser Wilhelm's fault, even though that's what we say in the Treaty of Versailles. It was it was far more nuanced. As is men, often the case with historical issues. Uh, one of the things that really interests me about, I mean, the book, admittedly not having read it yet, is that it occurs in a time period that is dear to my heart for several reasons. And here, I hope this is not a throwing a curveball at you but so for example i okay so there's the gilded age uh you know i i love newport rhode island where you've got the boulevard of mansions where all of those <clears throat> in rich industrialists the vanderbilts and the astors and i don't know if rockefeller had a home there uh that interests me because i study conspicuous consumption and the evolutionary use of conspicuous consumption and the, here comes thornstein Veblen, who wrote the theory of the leisure class, where he explained the mechanism of, you know, why do people engage in these types of lavish, conspicuous consumption, as would be the case with the Rockefellers and so on. So there's that element. I'm also a huge fan of Art Nouveau and Art Deco, which happened roughly around that period. Some of it is a bit after the, the time period of your book. 
Uh, I love the Vienna Circle, which again is slightly after your book. Can you comment on that? There, there seems to be, at least in my mind, a, a set of philosophical, aesthetic, scientific movements from roughly eight, 1880 to roughly 1930 that is really, truly uh, unique. A any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it, one of the fascinating things, in, in so Diesel's last year there was 1913. He's in Munich for that. Also happening in Munich at that time was Jung and Freud are together for a psychiatric convention. Uh, which is the last time they were seen together. Pablo Picasso came in for an art exhibition in 1913. Wow. And, and meanwhile, just down the road, Adolf Hitler was in Munich in 1913, selling little watercolor paintings wow, to pay for his sausage bucks. and That's beer. Incredible. Yeah, wow. yeah, all in 1913 in a little, I mean, Munich is not even that big. It's like 100, 200,000 people at that time. And that's where Diesel spent his last summer before he disappeared. Um, it, it's a fascinating period of time. I, I call it, I jokingly refer to it here with my family as the Downton Abbey, the early seasons in those years prior to World War I, when the world lived in such a different way. Think of all the empires that crumbled as a part of World War I. It was the Ottoman Empire, the Austrian Empire, the German Empire, the Russian Empire, all gone, all moving more toward more Western democ democratic constitutional uh, government systems. Urbanization was already happening, of course, but World War I really accelerated a lot of that. So we're less in sort of this feudal rural situation. Um, and of course, the, you know, the, the progress of science, as you say, it's really embodied in the advent of the World's Fair. I think the first one was like in the 1850s or early 1860s, where we're celebrating this crazy acceleration of progress that we're seeing, where all, all, we've got aluminum all of a sudden, and photography and flight with, uh, with rigid, you know, dirigibles. Um, just an, an incredible amount of new stuff happening with technology and the arts and the sciences that we we developed the World's Fair to celebrate it all. And, and I was going to say that exactly to what you just said, it, it's not as though it was only in science. <clears throat> Gustav Klimt is my favorite painter. He's also in that period. So it's as if there was something in the water that made people across many different domains uniquely creative and out-of-the-box thinkers. All right, next question. <clears throat> and there'll be, excuse me, there'll be a little uh, self-reference there. I'm assuming people are knocking at your door for the movie rights. You could talk about that. And if there is a dashing, handsome, supremely wise character, <laughs> I presume that I will be approached <clears throat> to play that lead. I was just going to say, I, we need to get you in touch with my uh, my producer after the show to make sure you're, you know, you're, you're called in. Uh, no, but seriously, are there, I mean, th this has to be, I mean, as I, as I was thinking about, you know, as I was thinking about our interview, I was thinking this guy must be having people knocking down his door with, with, with movie offers at this point. I mean, can you talk about any of it? Yeah. I mean, there's not too much to say other than we, I had, there is an option agreement uh, in place for film to TV, f film and TV rights, book to film. Um, but of course, you know, there are a million steps along that. That's the first step. So we've, we've taken the first step, which is great. And the book's only out, you know, a couple of weeks. So that's great. And I'm rooting for that. And of course I, in my mind, I do imagine, uh, the various gad sads of the world who could play diesel or, or other characters. I mean, there's so many. Great oh, so characters I'm the guy who the dies. Thing. I see. <laughs> I see. That's well, I'm going to, I'm going to count that as an anti-Semitic, uh, attack right there. Kill well, the Jew. Don't, don't, don't presume death. Don't presume death. That may not be the case. Oh, okay. but um, uh, the, I mean, the, so in in Russia, the way the the license for the diesel engine worked was the same as it was sort of a dominant theory of business at that time, which was to license the exclusive rights to manufacture and market the technology by national territory. Mm -hmm. So in Russia, the people who took the diesel license were the Nobel family. So Alfred Nobel, that we know from dynamite fame and the prizes, had two older brothers, Ludwig and Robert who founded the Russian oil industry. They were much more well-known and much more rich even than Alfred, his two older brothers. And uh, so Ludwig's son, Emmanuel, took the diesel license for Russia and they used it to pump oil from their fields and to power ships. And they built engines for the Tsar's Navy and things like that. In America, as I said, it was Adolphus Bush who used it to pump water in his breweries and power refrigeration. But he also had a separate business building submarine diesels for the US Navy. And he even tried to hire Chester Nimitz who became a diesel expert in 1912, and of course was a you know a famous submarine uh, commander of the U.S. Navy. There is a uh, isn't there a 
aircraft carrier named Nimitz? The, Nimitz, yeah, yep, yep. And if you, so there's a, a, a sort of museum thing called Victory in the Pacific, and it has Nimitz, sort of like a wax figure of Chester Nimitz. And in it, you can see him, he's signing papers at a desk, and he's missing the ring finger of his left hand. And the reason is because in 1912, he was in Augsburg, Germany, visiting diesel and diesel manufacturing plants. And he got his finger caught in an engine and it ripped his, his finger off. But that's, wow. that all sort of ties into the diesel story as well. Unbe uh, unbelievable. Actually, it, 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 uh, you know, as I was preparing for this uh, chat, uh, my, my wife and I listened in the car to your chat with your wife on her show. And uh, she looked at me. This is high praise because my, I mean, my wife reads, but she's not an incredibly voracious reader. She said, I think I'm going to read Doug's book. So that's that's high praise right there. To All get right. someone who's not a big reader to say, I want to read this book, you can't get much higher praise than that. So thank you for that. Uh, okay. Uh, what I'd like to do for the next few minutes, if, if we can, is, you know, I've got this very successful author on who has done both genres, the fiction and nonfiction. Maybe we could talk about what are, you know, some best practices that you could offer for aspiring authors? Because, you know, almost everybody feels as though, hey, you know, I'm a good storyteller. I, I'd i love to be an author. If you even watch mm -hmm. movies, I, I haven't done the, I can't confirm this quantifiably, but anecdotally, it seems that every movie has some character in it who is an author or an editor or something in the publishing house. So it's a very romantic profession but as we mm -hmm. both know, uh, very few authors become successful. Tell us, walk us through what are some absolute lessons that a aspiring author must have in order to be successful? That it's that is a fantastic question, and there are so many different answers for it. As you know, I had and you're coming on my show dedicated soon. I have award winning the top authors in the world come on, and every you ask that question, everyone gives a slightly different answer. But there are certain things I can tell you that I think really are helpful if you want to start putting you know pen to page one is i i do outline i'm, I'm an obsessive outliner i'll have drafts of my outline and there are others who don't lead child does not outline amor tolls obsessive outliner but for me it really helps stare down that blank page if you have written pages of an outline where, where there's no pressure it's easy to sort of jot a few things down or lines of dialogue out of sequence or a scene you know is going to happen even though it's three quarters through the book just write it and out of order, it doesn't matter. And then you just stick that in like, oh, that's chapter 17 and tuck it into your outline. But you've gotten something down. You've gotten the sort of, you've greased the, the skids a little bit. So I think outline is a great way to get going and just sort of get the motor running. Um, I, with my fiction, I it's, here's a strange difference for me. With fiction, I write by hand. I have a yellow legal pad and it helps me to, it feels more creative just to be able to draw lines or scratch things or move it around without being on the, computer and I can do it anywhere. I can do it in an Uber, on a plane, in a cafe, any of that is good. In fact, a little bit of background noise is kind of good for me. Right. With nonfiction though, I need to be at my desk. I'm surrounded by stacks of secondary resource materials. I, I actually, where with, with fiction, I don't want an internet connection. I, with nonfiction, I need it because there might be a scene where Rudolph is, you know, and there, this actually is a scene. He's walking across a bridge in London in 1870 as a young boy. And I'm like, well, what does a gas lamp look like in 1870 on a Brit? You know, so I want to do like little quick hits of tangential research. So it's nice to just have a, uh, you know, an internet connection where I can just find little things out that support the book and, and make it real and get those little details. Right. Um, I find doing research always does help. Even if you're writing fiction, just to make sure you get the scene, right. I, I know many writers, Joe, Joseph Cannon, has written a number of Cold War era books set in Germany. So he goes to Berlin, even though he's decades removed from the, the timing of his book, just walking those streets helps him get it with more force on the page when he writes it. Um, I think it's nice to have a, a regular habit. I, I tend to drop the kids at school, come home, have coffee, sit down and write from maybe nine to noon. I don't think you need to write more than three hours, but then the rest of the day is not just, you know, uh, cocktails. I do editing or other research or, you know, even outside reading. I think if you're going to write the, uh, you need to read a lot and you need to write a lot. And I'll just tell one quick story of a, of another guest who came on Diana Gabaldon, who wrote the Outlander series, the terrific books made into the series on 
the TV series on Showtime. And so she'd be on set because she goes to the set a lot for where they, they make the show and the actors would come over to her and say, love the books. How do you do it? It's like such a mystery. Please like tell me, give me some advice on how to do it. And she'll say, well, you know, before anything, the price of admission is you, you just have to write. So here's what you do. Every day, I want you to write for 15 minutes. Could be a letter, could be a shopping list, whatever it is. But for 15 minutes, every day for two weeks, write. And then at the end of two weeks, come back and talk to me and we'll, we'll, we'll do the next step. But that's the first step. So you may already have guessed what happens from here. They never come back. At the end of two weeks, no one's been able to do it. So, you know, the number one thing is if you embrace some alone time, if you enjoy the process of writing anything, but be it a diary, a letter or whatever, you're more than half the way there. Yeah, well, beautiful answers. Uh, I mean, in my case, I also like to, so you said I write from nine to 12. Uh, I also try to achieve some minimal number of words per day. I, I know this sounds, it's not very romantic, but you you know, you need grit and discipline. I mean, and of course, you know this when, if you're going to get a big book advance, uh, you know, there is a gun to your head from your publisher saying, you better get me that book by such and such date. And if you mm -hmm. lead busy lives, just the fact, it, it becomes very easy. To, well, today I can't really work on it because I'm teaching two classes and then I've got meetings with these graduate students and then I've got to apply for this grant and then I got to do this editorial stuff. And then I, I have to talk to Doug Brunt. And so, uh, well, maybe today I won't work, but then there's... E as many valid reasons tomorrow why I'm also busy. Right. So no matter yeah. what, and, and this is not a very romantic prescription, but it's a very important one. You have to have the discipline to say, as you said, just write. And so, you know, I could be suffering from bronchitis. I'm going to meet my minimal daily output. Now, sometimes it fluctuates. Sometimes I, I'm very productive and I, I might go off on a thing where I produce a thousand words that day. Other days, I've got to do a lot of a priori research. So it's only going to end up being 200 words, but I have a certain set of markers in my head of where I need to be in the unfolding story. If not, I could never turn the book around in time. Is that similar for you? Yes. Yes. And if you can treat that time as sort of sacrosanct, it almost becomes like exercise. You know, if you are in the habit of exercising six days a week or seven days a week, and then you miss three days, you feel a little off, like, oh, something's not right. I, I need to go exercise. And your, your body has come to crave it and want it. And I think it's the same here. I know many writers who are in the habit of writing every day. And if for whatever reason, they're traveling on book tour or something, they haven't written for a few days, they feel a little off. They're sort of walking around kind of antsy and they they come to want it. Now, I also know writers, again, this is, every writer's different. Some, some writers will procrastinate as much as possible. And, you know, they have to drag themselves over there but I'm not one of those. I, I run to my desk. It's, it's fun, creative alone time, which I enjoy. I, I really, I value that, that time of the day. Well, so I, I'm going to link what you just said about creativity or the process of creating to, and forgive the, the, the self plug. So in my, in my latest book, the, the happiness book, which hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about on your show. Uh, I talk about early in the ch in, in the book about, you know, the two most consequential decisions that you'll make that either will impart great happiness or great misery upon you, mm -hmm. choosing the right spouse, choosing the right profession. When I'm talking about choosing the right profession, I argue that all other things equal, a, a job that allows you to instantiate your creative impulse is one that's going to grant you access to purpose and meaning just by definition of the creative act. So I could be a chef, I could be a stand-up comic, I could be a, uh, you know, a screenwriter or a professor. All of these, while they're very, very different domain, domains of, of excellence, they share one thing, you're creating. An architect mm -hmm. creates a bridge. And that process is really magical. So the idea for me of one day opening up my laptop opening that Word document. There isn't a single letter that has been struck yet on that thing. And then magically, through the magic of the creative impulse, 12 months, 14, 16 months later, I press the send button to the publisher. That's unbelievable to me, even as someone yeah. who is a seasoned author. So maybe you could talk a bit about, because you said, I, I just love to go to my desk on a long time and create is this something that is just innate? Some of us have that creative impulse more than others, or is this something that could be fostered and nurtured? 
I, that, that is a great question. I think, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm loving your book and I did not realize that sad S A A D in Arabic means happiness and prosperity. That is, I was that's destined like these... to write this book. <laughs> the, the great reveals and twists and turns you don't see coming. Um, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's probably a bit of both. I mean, I, I've had a number of authors on whose parents were authors or writers or, you know, so you're, you sort of see it and you realize, oh my gosh, that could actually be a job like to the idea that writing could be something that is, that is a career and you can actually endeavor to it. So some people, it, it gets a little bit back to the, if you see it, you can be it type of thing. Um, Cause some people, I think it would just never occur to them like, Oh, I'll write a book, you know, even though they have, and then their creativity just gets expressed in other ways. Um, and I do think also that some of it is, it, it's almost, I, I probably it's around that 50, 50 thing in which you talk about, the genetic uh, forces behind happiness generally, like some people are born with a happy disposition as, as you are. And so the genetic makeup of happiness could be about 50% and the rest is, you know, what happens to you after you're born? It, it could be, I, I think it's probably somewhere in there in terms of creativity and writing as well. You, you yeah. might've hit the number. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense to me. So what about then, so, you know, one of the things that I, I I I truly never watch American Idol, but the only time that I'll ever watch it as a psychologist is in the early process where people are grossly overconfident about their abilities as a singer, right? So, I mean, they, they their singing is really an affront to human decency, but yet they're shocked. <laughs> you sound like Megan referring to me now. <laughs> is that in your singing abilities you mean yes exactly right and so and, and i find that very interesting because it's 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 so fascinating to see how poorly self-calibrated people are about their abilities what do you mean i thought i am like barry white and mariah carey my mother told me that i'm a great singer and so the reason why i'm talking about all that is because the same overconfidence trap can happen for aspiring authors in that yeah. it seems as though it's approachable right i mean singing doesn't seem like it's such a thing i just open my mouth and i think i could be just as good as Mar mariah carey no you can't mm -hmm. right whereas other things there does seem to be a barrier to entry i mean it's very few people overestimate their ability to be linebackers in the nfl because that seems to require a set of skills a, a, a react a physical reality that many people yeah. don't have and so people don't overestimate their ability to be nfl linebackers but to be an author or a singer it seems like yeah i think i could do it so how do we navigate through the conundrum of yes you can do it anybody can be anything but also being sufficiently calibrated to say look i i just don't think you have the the, the ability to to have the good mechanics of writing or to be a good storyteller yeah. get out of the game. How, how do we navigate through that? No, it's great. And, and our, our current culture or the coddling culture that we have now is, is certainly not helping. You know, in your example of the linebacker, for most people, that would just be staring you right in the face. You go out there one time, you get knocked in your back and you say, okay, that's not for me. I, I can't do that. But things that are much more subjective and well, it's all a matter of opinion. You know, I think that's where you need some good people around you. Um, you know, I joke with with Megan, who is my first and early reader. I'd much rather hear it from her than from the New York Times, you know, if something's not good. And she is unsparing in her in in both her praise and her and her criticism. You know, if something's not good, she'll tell me and that's what love is. You can you could you get it both ways. And uh, so you do you do need that. Now that said, of course, there are people who've gone to, you know, MFA classes where the teacher said, I'm sorry, you don't have what it takes. And you fast forward 10 years and they're winning a Pulitzer for fiction. Like Jennifer Regan was in a MFA class and, you know, the teacher thought she really didn't have that much potential. And right. then Jennifer Regan is on a Pulitzer Prize winning tour for a visit from the Goon Squad. So, you know, you do have to have some resilience and, and some thick skin. But then in the end, you, you also uh, need to be real about it. And I think some of that, it can become self-selecting because people have to pay their bills ultimately. And so if, uh, you know, that may select you right out of the process. If you find that your fiction writing isn't paying the rent, you might, you might be forced to, you know, get out into something where there's more in your zone of genius. Yeah. I, I mean, I, can you, can you mention again, what was the name of the author that you just mentioned? The one who, who had been told in her MFA class, who was that? Jennifer Egan. 
Okay, so I have a similar section in, I, I don't know if you, I don't, maybe you didn't get that far in the book yet, where I'm talking about grit, resilience, anti-fragility of failure. And so I have a whole mm -hmm. section where I take a bunch of, you know, some of the goats, the greatest of all time in different domains. Michael Jordan rejected from his uh, high school basketball team, sophomore. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steven Spielberg rejected not once, not twice, but three times from the USC film school. Lionel Messi, greatest player of all time, told that you're not going to be a professional soccer player. You're too small and frail. Zinedine Zidane, who's the greatest French soccer player of all time, uh, rejected by the Algerian coach. He could have played either for France or for Algeria by, by ancestry. And the Algerian coach looked at him and said, this guy is too slow. He's not going to make it. He's a World Cup winner. And so again, to our earlier point, Yes, the you know the idea of or oh, J.K. Rowling being rejected by every single publisher until the one right. that doesn't reject her. So <laughs> it's such a tough needle to thread because on the one hand you do want to promote the idea of resilience and keep going, but you also mm -hmm. have to have the ability to have the self calibration to say, I think I've received enough feedback now. I'm 52. I'm still waiting tables that maybe I need to get off that train. And it's not easy to know yeah. when is the right point to, to do what. I, I, I think true self-awareness is one of the greatest gifts anyone can have. Megan is, is extraordinary at that. She knows what she's good at. She knows what she's not. Her self-belief behind that, that estimation is unflappable. You know, if she knows she's good at it, she'll, she'll stay in there. And if she knows she's not, she's like, yeah, that's not for me. And she'll quickly move on. But she, she's probably the most self-aware person I know. Well, I and can so it's you, an extraordinary gift. It really is. And by the way, the, the Delphic maxim, know thyself, has survived for thousands of years precisely for that, right? I, I don't like the, a lot of, you know, you know, uh, current gurus will offer you all sorts of uh, prescriptions of how to live life that are incredibly intricate and you know, right uh, walk three times then take a three second meditation thing then look to the left and because research has found that it reduces your cortisol levels by seven percent bullshit the really important prescriptions <laughs> are those that are like the delphic maxim know thyself mm -hmm. it sounds simple but it's profoundly deep precisely because it's exactly as you said about megan there's not there's no greater gift than to know what you know what you don't know one of the mm -hmm. things i say that why i'm i knock on wood uncancelable is because i'd like to think that i also thread that needle really well when i walk into a room to debate someone on a topic that i'm i'm knowledgeable about and i've done my homework good luck to you if you want to debate me but on the other hand you could ask me a million questions where i'll say hey doug that's a fantastic question it's above my pay grade i know very little about this i don't bullshit my way out of something and being calibrated about what i'm good at and not good at allows me to always maintain the trust of the audience because mm -hmm. i never falter or fail because when i don't know i just say i don't know i don't wing it yeah i think that's and that, that exactly said that builds trust and you come across as as genuine, and and it's also great to hear a professor who's who's written all these books, you know, to say I'm not done learning. There's lots of stuff I don't know, and I'm I'm I would love to hear from people who know it, so then I'll know it. It's it's a great way to go through life. Can I tell you something? I mean, you can't see the rest of my study here, but I'm surrounded by a gigantic personal library of books, probably you know. 10 times the number of books that are behind you. And one of the mm -hmm. greatest stressors in my life is when I walk in every day in my study and I know that there's at least 400 unbelievable books that I've yet to read. So there's all this juicy, <laughs> incredible knowledge out there that's not in here. And that, of course, makes me it makes me compelled to, to read more, but it also mm -hmm. grounds me in that I know how little I know of what there is to know. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, hear I try you. the ones that go on the shelf. Generally, I've read there are a few gifts or things that I know I'm going to read, but it's I it's a tough process to get on the shelf in my in my office. You probably you're probably sent books to, you know, get blurbed and things like that all the time that find their way on there that you haven't, and, and haven't the, read yet. Indeed. Uh, all right. Any projects that you're working on, you know, beyond what we've been talking about that you'd like to mention here, or promote or plug, please take it away. The, well, the, the one thing I'll say that the podcast takes up a fair amount of time interviewing a number of great authors coming up, yourself included. And uh, the other thing I'll say about my next book project is there's a funny saying that my editor and I have bandied about, which is that sometimes 
one author's footnote can become another author's whole book. And in my case, I think one of my own footnotes will become my own next book. So I want to stay in this time period, this quarter century before World War I. And I found an interesting story that I think is similar to Diesel in that it's like this hidden history. It's people you know, but you you only knew a percentage or so. And, and there's a whole revelation behind that that has connections to people throughout the world. That Diesel, you know, there's a huge connection to Winston Churchill and the, the world leaders of the time and Adolphus Bush and the Nobel family and all these things sort of weave in together in this crazy tale. And I, I, uh, another, this other one won't really solve a, you know, a murder murder or missing persons case, but it will, it will delve into that hidden history element that the diesel book does. Now, now I feel like you've thrown a challenge for me to go through every footnote and try to guess (laughs) who it is. So if you, if you start seeing DMS from me on your Twitter, in your Twitter, uh, account, I'm probably going to be trying to guess who that might be. Hey, Doug, what a pleasure to have you. I can't wait to hopefully meet you in person soon. Uh, And by that, I mean both you and your lovely wife. And hopefully I will be coming with my wife. Uh, But uh, real honor to have you on. Please stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline properly. Real delight to have you on. Cheers. Well, the, the honor was mine. Thank you. Thank you, sir.